flooding through my mind of uh, childhood days, and I have enjoyed being here so very much. And of course, this is the first time for me to see your beautiful new church. And uh, I know Brother and Sister Dylan were working hard, yes. along with the congregation, Amen. to build a new place of worship. Yes. And I am so thankful that it was built and that Brother Dylan could minister in this beautiful yes. place for, I believe, a year and a half uh, before the Lord brought him home. And uh, it's also a great joy to see Sister Dylan here tonight. Amen. And yes. we have loved the Dillons for so many years and had so many good times together. And I, I have often thought how God brought the Dillons back to Rupert after they had left. He brought, they came back as the Lord directed them and uh, have done such a wonderful work for God. And, and now, after Brother Dillon was called home, then God has blessed you with another wonderful pastor in Brother Crawford. And uh, I am just so thankful for the wonderful work that he is doing here. And um, I also want to thank you for all the kindness you have shown to Stan. Stan has told me so many times how happy he is to have a home here and uh, he has told me how all of you and Brother Crawford even has worked so hard to help him make this move. And as we have been enjoying his nice home here in Rupert, I have been so thankful because just four weeks ago, I was in New Delhi, India, sitting in the place where Stan lives and works and has worked for many years. And I know the sacrifice that Stan has made for many, many years, living in about one and a half rooms. The half room is the office of the Bible College, and he just has really one room to live in. And he has done this for so long, and his things have been scattered all over the country. <laughs> and now he has them all together in one place. And uh, I've just been so thankful that after all these years, Stan finally has a nice place that he can enjoy and have all of his things together. Amen. So thanks to all of you who have helped make this possible. We appreciate this so much. Most people don't have a clue as to the sacrifice Stan has made for the work of God, but he has certainly done a great work. And when I've been there twice to teach in the Bible College now, and I don't believe I have ever seen a Bible school where there is so much enthusiasm and happiness and joy that I've seen in the New Delhi uh, Bible College. The students, the teachers, the staff, everybody just seems to be enjoying what they're doing. And that makes a big difference when Amen. you are happy yes. in what you're doing. Yes. And uh, I appreciate so much the work he has done. Now, it is a real joy to have my sweet wife Helen with me here in Rupert. And I want Helen to come up and say whatever she would like. She has been to Rupert before. And uh, I would like for you to come up if you would, Helen. We, we now live in Westerville, Ohio. That's a suburb of Columbus, and enjoy living there very, very much. And Helen and I have now been married for almost 14 years. 14 happy years. And I'm so glad she's with us. Well, it is a joy to be with you again tonight. We've been in, or I've been in one service in your other building. And certainly enjoy the presence of the Lord. And that's the one, most wonderful thing about the Lord is you can take him wherever you go. Yes. And I want to be in that place that he is with me because the world we live in today, I wouldn't want to live in it without him. And some of those that have started out with him have not stayed with him. And I have no idea what they're going back to other than trouble and problems. That's it. And you know there's no generation gap and serving the Lord. That's right. Yeah. It's good for the young. In fact, my mother, I think, was about four or five years old when she received the Holy Ghost. Right. And um, she never changed.
Some people may change the ways of doing things, but the Word of God does not change, and I am so thankful for that. So thankful for His Spirit. Amen. And I was 11 years old when God came into my life, and it will soon be 59 years next month. And He just grows sweeter and sweeter and sweeter every day. And sometimes people don't understand us. But that's, that doesn't make any difference because if we keep our eye on the goal, yes. we know we're going to be the winners. And uh, I want to see Jesus someday. Amen. And I want to see him in peace. Yes. I don't want to be there and he'll say, you should have done this, you should have done that. And there are things I know I should have done that I didn't do. But I ask him to forgive me. You know, that's a daily prayer I have right. every day. A repentant heart before Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful for his love. And as Brother Crawford was telling about the service in Salt Lake City, you know, it's such a beautiful sight to see people receive the Holy oh, yeah. Ghost. Oh, yeah. And all through that conference, from the very beginning, right. people were receiving the Holy Ghost. Yes. And people were being baptized mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Right. And they have a baptistry that you <coughs> can see them being baptized. And what a joy, but what a testimony in that city. And I'm so thankful that we could tell them about Jesus. They were very nice and very open because everyone we came, you know, talking to, we would invite them to service and many asked questions. And it's so wonderful to tell them about the greatest friend they could ever have. And I'm thankful again for his love, for his mercy and his kindness. It's good to be here with Sister Dillon to see her again. And I know God's been with her. And he will be with you, just as a brother said tonight. He doesn't leave us nor forsake us. We don't understand many things that happen in our lives. But we have a God that does everything right. Yes. And we'll never have the answers for everything. And the enemy wants us to sit down and try to figure it out. See, that way he can get us to thinking negative thoughts. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus, it's what's going to be our happiness. And we're happy to be with uh, Brother Stan. I know he is enjoying that home so much. Now he, was it Brother Crawford said he had everything, or his dad, I guess, said he had everything all over the, the states. Well, yeah. he, has th he had things around the world, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing he has are books. If you ever know yes. <laughs> you that, he enjoys reading. But you know, it's, I thought, you know, um, his dad was saying how, how hard he works. Well, he had a wonderful example. That's right. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Of Harry and Sister Audrey. They gave their lives yes. To, yes. to be missionaries mm -hmm. and did a wonderful, wonderful job. Yes. And I can remember having them in our home in Columbus. And uh, we always enjoyed having missionaries. And it was always a joy to, to hear what they had to say. But when they go to these countries, they give up their family here for a time. Not that they separate or disconnect that, but they go without any of them going with them. And they stay there, many of them, for several years before they used to come back. But you know God will bless them. And it's a wonderful, wonderful joy to serve Jesus Christ. He's been so good to me, and uh, having parents that brought me up in the truth. And I can remember stories they told me when I was a child. And you know, we need to tell these stories. How God enriches your life, what he does for you. And we need to teach it to our children. That's the way I grew up, learning about the things of God. And it just put a hunger in my heart. And I want that desire. I want a hunger and a thirst Amen. for him every day. But I want to tell others about him. And I want to see his glory fall in such a mighty way yes. that just hundreds will come yes. Yes. wanting Jesus yes. Christ. Yes. The Lord yes. bless you. Praise God. Praise God. We could stand together now, and I would like to... Read the word of the Lord. We'll read.
straight from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And then also we will read from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. As I have prayerfully considered the service tonight, I have decided that it would be pleasing to the Lord if I would talk to you about this subject. A look at the past and our hope for the future. A look at the past and our hope for the future. I would not even call this a message or a sermon, but rather I want to share with you some experiences I have had in my early life and then I want to talk to you about what I feel is our only hope for the future. I used to sing as a child, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. But after living for 70 years, I understand a little bit more about that pilgrimage that all of us are taking right now. All right. From the time you were born until the time you lay your head to rest and are on your way to be with the Lord, you are on a pilgrimage. This journey that we take on this earth is just a pilgrimage. This pilgrimage has many, many changes and transitions and unusual things that happen in our life. And so we're going to give a little attention tonight to the past, and then we're going to talk about our hope for the future. Let's pray now that the will of God might be done. I thank and praise you for the wonderful privilege of being in Rupert with Brother Crawford and this congregation. I thank you, Lord, that you made this possible. And I pray now that somehow you will bless your words and what I feel you have asked me to speak to them now. May thy anointing and thy blessing rest upon this service, we pray. And may thy will be done. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You may be seated, friends. It was in Rupert, Idaho, that my father baptized me in Jesus' name when I was nine years old. I remember it well. But before being baptized in Jesus' name in Rupert, my father pastored the Twin Falls Church for not less than five years. We went to that building today and parked the car outside and just sat there and I shared some experiences, things I remembered well of my father pastoring that church. Perhaps it was around 60 years ago. My father lived, first of all, in a very small house, not far from the church, 
Later, he moved into that large house on the corner just across the street from the church. It has a different name on the signboard now, but I don't pay that much attention to what's on the signboard or the shingle. I pay a lot more attention to what's inside, right. what's being preached and what's yeah. being practiced. And what was inside in those days was something very special. My uh, early memories of that church would first of all probably take me to the prayer room where on Sunday night, almost every Sunday night after the message was preached, we would go down into the basement, which was the prayer room. I have memories, childhood memories, of seeing the power of God fall in that basement. I have seen people slain under the power, lying on the floor, as though they were in a trance for sometimes one or two hours. I have seen people so drunk in the spirit in Twin Falls in that basement that they actually had to be helped to their home. Yes. They could not go home. As a child, I saw people laughing in the spirit. First of all, I could not understand it, but I saw people laughing, laughing and right. laughing in the spirit. I saw people dancing in the spirit. I saw beautiful worship in that prayer room in Twin Falls. These are memories I have of my childhood in Twin Falls. I well remember, of course, the Yaden family. The Yaden family attended that church, and Grandpa and Grandma Yaden were faithful members. They lived down in the uh, Rock Creek, was that's what it was called, in a little canyon area. And I remember picnics we had there at their place. But I remember also Frank Yaden, who, when he was in the service, had some kind of a fever that caused Frankie to lose all of his hair. He had no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair on his head. Because of this fever, Frankie was very embarrassed, and he always wore a hat. Not a small baseball hat, but a big cowboy hat. You would always see Frankie with that hat on. And when Frankie came back from the service and did not have his hair and wore his hat always, he did not come to church. So one day my father said to Frankie, Frankie, we want you to come to church. We miss you so much. Please come. And Frankie said to my dad, he said, Oh, Brother Sism, I could not come to church because I must wear my hat. I've lost all my hair. I'm afraid to be seen without my hat on. And my father said to Frankie, Frankie, we know you, we love you, we yes. understand that you lost your hair. Come on to church and wear your hat. We don't mind, you can wear your hat in the service. And he came. Frankie came to church with his hat on and sat in the church wearing that big hat and he became regular in his attendance. And then one day my father went to Frankie, knowing that Frankie played the violin very, very well. And he said, Frankie, I wish you would play in the orchestra. Mm -hmm. And Frankie said, oh, Brother Sism, I could not do that. I would have to wear my hat sitting up on the platform. Everybody would see me with a hat on. I could not do that. And my father said, Frankie, we all understand, we all love you. Please play your violin in the orchestra. And sure enough, he brought his violin, and he became regular in uh, playing the violin in the orchestra. Well, one night in that prayer room, while the Spirit of God and the power of God was moving upon the people, yes. Frankie, fell to the floor on his back and his hat was crushed under his head and people were around Frankie praying for him and something happened and there was a swish and that hat went sailing across the prayer room and about that time Frankie started speaking in other tongues and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And from that moment forward, all the fear was removed from right. Frankie's life. Yeah. And you would hardly ever
never see him with a hat on again, certainly not in church. He was no longer ashamed to be seen without his hat. These are memories I have of the working of the Holy Spirit. And as a child, I saw it in Twin Falls, Idaho. Eventually, we came to Rupert. We did not stay as long in Rupert because it was while we were here that my father was chosen as the superintendent of the Northwest District and they wanted him to be full-time, so we had to leave Rupert and move to Oregon. And that was something I did not want to do. I complained about it as a child because I liked Rupert. I loved Rupert. And uh, I have wonderful memories of the church in Rupert. Oh, yes. The good fellowship, the times we had together, the moving of the Spirit and the services. I remember so many good things about Rupert. And I did not want to leave here. When we got to Oregon, I said, oh, Dad, it's raining so much here. And, the weather in Idaho was so nice. I loved it in Rupert. And my father said, Oregon is weeping over the conditions in Idaho. <laughs> he was trying to pacify me. <laughs> One of the memories I have in Rupert, in the little house that we lived in, and tomorrow I hope we can find it. I want to show Stan that house. But I had done something wrong, and my father was not pleased with me, and he told me he was going to give me a spanking. So knowing that I was going to get a spanking, I put two wallets in my back pocket, hoping to give a little padding and help a bit. And my sister Fern knew what was happening. She was in with me on all of this. So my dad took me into his little office and he began to paddle me and I just cried out and oh, it was just painful. And, and finally he stopped and when we came out of the office, Fern saw me. She was sitting on the piano bench there and she looked at me and kind of smiled, and I smiled at her. And uh, my father saw that, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so then he took us both into the office, and he spanked us both. Frank got us spanking too, that's all. <laughs> he took out the wallets and gave me a very good spanking. <laughs> all kinds of memories. <laughs> Sister Walker, Sister Walker was my Sunday school teacher here at Rupert. Sister Walker taught me something that always stayed with me. So many times we tell children, don't do this and don't do that, but we don't tell them why they shouldn't do it. And often I would hear you shouldn't use curse words or swear words. And my mother even more than once put some soap in my mouth because I said something I shouldn't say. She was just trying to help me understand I should be careful. But it was Sister Walker who taught us why you shouldn't say some of these words, what they came from, how they all came into existence, and that stayed with me all of my life. Right. Wonderful memories. Eventually we moved to Oregon, and after waiting for 14 years, my mom and dad were able to make their way to Indio. They had both gone to Bible school in Oakland, California, and even before they were married, my mother had already felt a burden for India, and of course my dad had. So when they were married, they were united in their desire to go as missionaries to India. They had to wait a long time. Dad served on the general board. He even served on the foreign missions board. And all of this time, he was gaining more experience. And finally, they went to India. We got on the ship in Portland, Oregon, and it took us two months to reach India. It was a freighter. We traveled to many different parts of the world. I was 14 years old when we got on this ship and 15 years old when we arrived in <laughs> <laughs> I 
And that was the beginning of a whole new life for me. Yes. I saw beggars for the first time, poverty-stricken people, people wearing almost no clothes, skin and bones, couldn't understand it. They were running along behind us with their hands out like this, but she's, but she's little children, skin and bones. And I said to my father, I said, what does all this mean? And he said, they're just asking for something to eat. I had never seen this kind of poverty in my right. life. And so I was introduced to a whole new life. And I was taken to boarding school along with my sister. Bert and I were put in boarding school and that was the beginning of our life in India. Many times I remembered the old Ben campground. And it was on the Ben campground that I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit after an all-night prayer meeting, not too long before we left for India. And there's one person on that Ben campground who made a tremendous impact on my life, especially one person and that was Sister Ruby Keys, as we knew her in those days, now Sister Clem. But it was Ruby Keys who talked so much to us about consecration and commitment. And then twice I clearly remember we were asked to come down by the creek that flowed through the campground, and a little bonfire was built there. And next to the bonfire, in a box, were pine cones. And we were told that if you would like to make a commitment of your life to God, you can take a pine cone from that box and throw it into the fire. Two times I did this. As just a child, I went over to that box, picked up a pine cone and threw it in the fire, and then said a few words about the fact that I wanted to commit my life to God. Uh -huh. Little did I know then what was ahead of me. Uh -huh. That was just the beginning of my pilgrimage. But now, to this day, I believe that that early commitment yes. made a difference. Oh, yes. Yes. However, that was not the only commitment I have made to God. As a matter of fact, it seems my whole life has been a life of renewing All right. my commitment All right. to God. Yes. Over and over. Yes. And so in boarding school, we were surrounded by people who did not know anything about Pentecost. We were the only Jesus named Pentecostal students in the school, my sister and I. But God somehow kept his hand upon us. I remember one night, I came to my home because my folks would come up and spend a little time during the hottest part of the year where there was no air conditioning where they lived and it was miserably hot, so they'd come up to the mountains. And I remember one night coming home to my house. I stepped up on the porch and I heard something. I moved closer and listened, and it was my mother praying. And I listened to what she was saying, and she was praying for her son, Harry, All right. that God would keep his hand upon him. Oh, that song, if I could hear my mother pray again. How I thank God for praying mothers, and I thank God for my mother who prayed for me many, many times. One time when I was in their home and down on the plains where my mom and dad lived in that miserable heat, my mother was in intercessory prayer. As she was agonizing in prayer, laying on the cement floor in intercessory prayer, the lady who helped us in the house heard my mother agonizing in prayer and thought she was sick and she went running to see if she could help her. And my father had to tell her, Mary Amma, don't worry. Madam is in prayer. She's praying and she's all right. Eventually, after completing my high school years, I felt, of course, the call of God. By that time, I knew that God wanted me to be a missionary in India. Yes. 